Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, y'all. I'm Julie, and I'm an alcoholic. (laughs) And um, first, I just want to tell y'all that I am so very grateful and hum- humbled to be here. I'm, just, I'm honored to be here tonight because there was definitely a time in my life when nobody was asking me to go anywhere. Um, I've actually been thrown out of the masquerade, if any of y'all know about that. Yeah. Whew. So anyways, okay. Um, <laughs> you might be an alcoholic if. Um, so my sobriety date is 8:23 of 04. Um, it's a miracle. I have a home group. It is the North Marietta group. We meet on Sunday mornings at 9:30 a.m. at the Seventh Day Adventist Church on 41 in Marietta. If you're ever in the area, please come by and visit us. We'd love to see you. Last week, I watched um, 59 years where the chips get picked up, and the year before, it was 54 years. And it's not a big group, y'all, but they have some amazing sobriety there, and we'd love to see your faces. Um, I would like to thank the committee and everybody that just abandoned me. Um, (laughs) Katie, Damon, Thank you, um, Allison. Thank you so much. And thanks, guys, for the wonderful um, gift basket. That was dinner, and I appreciate that very much. And thank you, Mike, for, 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 your, for your service, for, for being willing to donate your time and your talents to us here at the Atlanta Roundup. Um, and I would like to tell you all, you know, I am not a preacher. I am not a teacher. I am not a spiritual guru. And I am not a big big pumper. I'm just a drunk who's trying to stay sober one day at a time and hopefully help another alcoholic along the way. And this is my story. This is my story from my perspective as it is today. You know, and back there when a lot of this stuff was happening, it was not my perspective. But, you know, by the grace of God, through a sponsor, through working the steps, um, it is my perspective today. And I'm just really, really grateful to be here. Oh, yeah, so... um, I was born a long time ago, far, far away, <laughs> um, in this little town called Anderson, Indiana. And um, my parents, my parents, you know, they're, they're salt of the earth. They're really, they're really good people. They're teetotalers. Um, and I was the second child born to them. They had a daughter that was born two years before me, and she didn't live long enough for them to plan the funeral. Um, and two years after I was born, my, my parents had a little boy that was named after my father. And as far back as I can remember, for as long as I can remember, I always felt restless, irritable, and discontent. My mom tells me that I was born a nasty two-year-old. And I pretty much stayed that way until I came into these rooms. Just saying, y'all. So, born in Anderson, Indiana. From Indiana, we moved to Georgia. From Georgia, we moved to Chicago. From Chicago, we moved to Georgia. From Georgia, we moved to Jersey. From Jersey, we moved back to Georgia. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was really confused, and I had no idea how to talk. <laughs> and I still struggle with that. I'm going to be honest with y'all. My accent depends a lot on who I'm talking to at the time. I don't know, self-preservation or something. Um, you know, we moved around so much, and I found out, you know, kids are mean. Kids are really, really mean. Um, not only are they generally brutally honest, they're mean. And... Um, when we moved to Georgia that last time, we moved to Paulding County, Georgia. If y'all aren't familiar, kind of like the armpit of Georgia. Um, and coming from Jersey, I had no idea what a redneck was. I found out quick, and I found out quick that I was a Yankee. And I decided if I was going to be a Yankee, and I was going to be a damn Yankee, I was going to be the meanest damn Yankee you ever did see. And that's what I did. 
you know, I, I always felt like I had this hole in, in this hole in my chest, just this empty space. I didn't fit in no matter where I went. And and I was full of fear. I know I know that today, but I didn't know that at the time. And um and as a result, I acted out in anger. Um, my father is a Vietnam veteran, and so they're, they're, he had some problems with rage when I was growing up, and I saw that as being very powerful, and I wanted to be powerful. And I figured if I pushed you away quick enough, you wouldn't have the opportunity to hurt me. And so that's what I did. My mom said from the time my little brother was born, I would stick him with bobby pins, just or not bobby pins, diaper pins, just to make him scream. Just me. Um, whew. okay, I can do this. <laughs> um, I also, you know, I also got in a lot of trouble when I was young. When, um, when we moved to, to Georgia, my parents put us in Christian schools, and I didn't do real well in Christian schools, <laughs> surprisingly enough. Um, but they did, after a couple of years, they gave us a choice, and I chose to go back to public schools. And when I got back to public schools, I really excelled. That education that I had gotten in those Christian schools far surpassed what the level that they were at in, in, in public schools. And kids were mean about that, too. And I real quickly decided that I did not want to stand out as being a goody tissue. Um, yeah, and the, the first time that I actually forged my dad's signature was when my algebra grade went from a 97 to a 19. Yeah, um, and it wasn't because I was dumb. It was because I didn't do anything. I did nothing. I didn't show up. I didn't do the work that they gave me. Um, I was hell-bent on if you told me to do something, you could be darn sure I wasn't going to do it. And I didn't. And... um my very first drink, um, I think I was 14 years old, but I may have only been 13. Like I said, my parents were teetotalers. We had nothing like that in the house. But our next-door neighbors, they had alcohol in their house, and they were kind of scandalous anyway, y'all. Yeah. She was older than he was by at least a year or two. <laughs> they both had had previous marriages. Yeah. Those are the kind of people that have alcohol in their house, right? <laughs> so their daughter and I, actually, that's probably was me, um, decided that we were going to steal the booze out of their out of their freezer um, one day and try this alcohol. You know, we had no experience with it, but I knew what I'd seen on TV. You know, I knew the stories that I had heard from the bad kids at school. So we stole a bottle of vodka out of her parents' freezer, and we mixed it with strawberry knee-high. At the bus stop waiting to go to school that morning. <laughs> Again, you might be an alcoholic if your first drink is around 6 a.m. <laughs> you know, and she didn't like it. She didn't like the taste of it. And I thought that was fabulous because I wasn't drinking it for the taste of it anyway. My very first drink, I set out to get drunk. I set out to change the way that I felt. And by the time we got to school, I had drank the whole thing. And I was absolutely plastered. And for the first time ever in my whole life when I got to school, I was the most popular girl. I was the prettiest girl. I was the girl with you know, the best sense of humor. I heard an old-timer one-time speaker say, um, alcohol made her prettier and wittier and kittier. <laughs> alcohol did that for me. I'm just telling y'all. There, there were a lot of consequences to showing up at school absolutely smashed. Um, the police were called. The breathalyzer was failed. Um, and, and, and my parents were called. You know, I can't imagine what they were thinking getting called to school to pick up their drunken daughter. They didn't have any alcohol in the house, and I was very clearly smashed. Um, and so there, you know, my, my family, my family also was very religious. Um, as far as far back as I can remember, my dad has always been very involved in the church. Uh, he was a deacon. He was an assistant preacher. He was an usher. He was a Sunday school teacher. To this day, he still does prison ministries. So there were a lot of consequences that were set out for me because of that bad behavior. And I got to tell y'all, 
I'm also not willing to face consequences for my bad behavior. So when you know they told me that there were chores that were going to have to be done, because I got suspended from school for 10 days. And um, during those 10 days, there was not to be any slacking off. I wasn't allowed to see my boyfriend. I was going to have to clean the house. I was going to have to do this, do that, do the other. And I wasn't willing to do that. So in an effort to, um, to manipulate the people that cared about me, I emptied my parents' medicine cabinet. I took everything that they had in it. And that was my first suicide attempt. Because if I can't have what I want when I want it, I'll check out. At 13 or 14 years old, you don't really know what's in your parents' medicine cabinet. And like, you know, cough drops and Tums and aspirin did not have the desired effect. (laughs) I did end up in the hospital. I did have to have my stomach pumped. Um, But, you know, my poor parents who loved me so much, I mean, it just ripped them apart that I would even try to kill, that I would try to kill myself. And as a result, all those, all those consequences to my bad behavior went away. You know, I was sick. I got to play the victim. Oh, poor pitiful me. I almost died. You know. Um, and so all those consequences went away. And, you know, there's still consequences to be faced, right? Because I'm an alcoholic. And i got to tell you, i got outside issues, too. And everything I do, I do alcoholically. But I also do everything, Okay. And that includes voice. And at 14 years old, I found myself pregnant. Bad behavior. Consequences of bad behavior, you know. And my parents really wanted me to have that baby and give him up for adoption. Because I was only 14. But don't forget, you don't get to tell me what to do. And so as a result, I ran away. I found out that in Paulding County, if you have a note from your doctor saying that you're pregnant, you can get married at that age. So that's what I did. I ran away and got married. And, you know, honestly, at that age, my thinking, what better way to fix this huge empty space inside of me than to have a husband? I mean, he has to love you, right? (laughs) You know? Okay, okay, so maybe not the husband, but the baby, right? The baby's coming, and the baby's going to love me unconditionally, right? The baby's going to fix everything. And during that, that, during that pregnancy, I'm going to tell you, I didn't, I didn't drink. I quit smoking. I mean, I didn't drink. I was only 14. It's not like it was hard to not get a hold of alcohol. <laughs> but I didn't make any effort to get a hold of alcohol while I was pregnant. Okay, so, um, and when he, when he was born... You know, and, and I and I held that baby, I held that baby in my arms. I really, really thought that that was going to be it. That's what was going to stop my bad behavior. Um, and I'm going to tell you, I'll tell you that when he was, after he was born, the doctor sat down on the end of my bed and he cried and he told me that I would never be able to have kids again. I um, had had turned 15, so I was 15 when he was born. But the doctor said I'd never have children again. And y'all, my thinking is skewed. My thinking is skewed. I'm thinking, woohoo, no more consequences to that bad behavior, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and needless to say, having a baby did not cure what did didn't cure what ailed me. So, um, his father and I divorced and I continued on with my bad behavior. I got married again, took another hostage actually. Um, that one didn't even last a year. Um because he was an asshole. Um, <laughs> but you know, during this time, my disease is progressing. My disease is really progressing. Yeah, I worked. Um, I worked at a bowling alley in Woodstock, and um, I did that at 18 years old. And at 18 years old, you could serve alcohol, but you couldn't legally drink alcohol. The drinking age is 21. You might be an alcoholic if you wake up in a hotel room, the strangers you don't know. And when you go back to work the next day, you find out you ran up a $265 bar tab that you don't remember. But you know what the consequences to that were? I had to pay the tab. No biggie. No biggie. They let me go back to work. So I was all right with that. And um, and my disease continued to progress. And I you know, began dabbling in other things. And everything else that I did, I did alcoholically. And um, 
I was on the hunt for somebody to fix what was wrong. What was wrong? That having that baby hadn't hadn't fixed what was wrong. I still needed something. I still needed something to fix the way that I felt. I did not like the way that I felt. I did not like myself. Um, so I actually found hostage number number three. At this time, I got a little smarty off because I'm getting a little older, right? 23, 24 years old. I found me an older guy with a job. <laughs> And a vehicle. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Um, you know, and I and I actually went into that marriage telling him that I've got a problem. I've got a problem. You know, I have I've been in front of judges. I've been to doctors. You know, um, and I've got a problem. So I need you to control this. I and mean, what a horrible responsibility to put on somebody. He was an asshole. He couldn't do it. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, and actually, that's not even true. That was my thinking at the time. But I got to tell you all, that man tried really, really hard to help me. Um, you know, he, there was, a, there was a time when he tried to take me into Charter Beachford. Uh, he took me to a lot of places, saw a lot of therapists. At one point, I actually had this therapist who made me do this exercise. He said, Julie, you know, I want you to look back over 10 years from age 14 when you first started drinking to where you are now at 24 and I want you to make a list for me of every place that you've ever lived let's just start we'll start with the easy stuff right so after I got to 40 he told me I could stop and then we would go ahead and look at that and he asked me if I saw a pattern and I'm going to tell y'all with everything I had in me I looked at that paper to see if I could see a pattern and I told him, I said, I do. I absolutely see a pattern. People are assholes, and it is hard to find a good place to live. <laughs> My thinking is skewed, y'all. I meant that. I really thought that everybody else was the problem. And at that point, obviously, he was a problem, too, so I left him, too. And um, got married again within 30 days. Yes, I did. Um, Y'all are going to be surprised that one didn't even last a year, but it didn't. You know, and I used to look back on these. I used to look back on those first four husbands. And I'm going to say four husbands, four, before I turned 30, married and divorced four times. I told you, I do it all alcoholically, right? And I used to look back and I used to think, you know, I mean, these guys, they're losers. <laughs> My picker is broken, right? I'm so grateful for this program, this program that makes me look at myself. It makes me look at my part. And today I realized I was the loser. <laughs> you know, why would any of them have stayed with a raging alcoholic like I was? Why would any of them have put up with trying to control me and my disease? No way. It, you know, it's just, it's a, it's a ridiculous fantasy. It's a fantasy. And I did a lot of living in a fantasy world. So yeah, um, so when that last when that last husband escaped, um, and I forgot I forgot to tell y'all um, the older guy. Yeah, we were only together a few months when um, I found out I was pregnant. You know, my God, my God works miracles for me even when I'm even when I'm not willing to see them because I'm gonna tell y'all I did not think that was a miracle. Okay. Um, we actually went to the doctor's office to try to have that taken care of. And again, you know, God stepped in and um, wouldn't allow that, that procedure to take place. So they weren't, they wouldn't do that. But, you know, I've always, always, always got something going. These wheels are always spinning, right? And um, that first baby was nine pounds. That was why they told me I'd never have kids again. So, you know, I'm trying to think, what can I do? Because we really don't want to go through that again. I don't want to go through that again. And it's all about me, y'all. It really is. It's all about me. And I'm a big thump, right? So um, I did happen to notice that on the side of the cigarette pack, it says, may cause low birth weight. Yes, I smoked through that entire pregnancy. And I am so not proud of that today. Um, but it made perfect sense to me at the time. It made sense to me. That's how skewed my thinking is. You know, that I would be willing to subject this baby that I'm carrying in to, 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 to smoking cigarettes the entire time. And I relapsed a couple of different times. Well, this time was not like the first. I didn't put everything down. I wasn't able to because this disease is progressive. 
to y'all. It doesn't get better. It gets worse. And that's what happened. I wasn't able to stay clean all the time that I was pregnant this time. But I was really blessed. You know, I was born with, with a second son who was absolutely beautiful. All his little fingers, all his little toes. Um, you know, God loves me the most. This, and he does for me what I can't do for myself. All right, so back forward again. Got rid of his dad. Got rid of the next one. And, um, <laughs> but you know, even, even with two of the most beautiful boys in the whole wide world, that couldn't stop my disease from progressing. That couldn't fill this horrible, empty space that was inside of me. You know, that couldn't help me look at myself in the mirror. You know, and I would love to tell y'all that I was a good mother to those boys. I was not a good mother to those boys. Absolutely not. You know, I, um, you know, I didn't take care of them. I didn't take care of them properly. I didn't nurture them the way that they needed to be nurtured. You know, basically I abused them mentally, emotionally, psychologically, um, you know, because because I'm selfish, I'm selfish, and I'm self-centered, and it was all about me. Um, so, anyways, after after number four escaped, um, I called number three and asked him if he would please come back to the house and please take my children. You know, I like to think that I had a moment of clarity. You know, I knew that I could not take care of these kids and that they deserve better. So I asked the younger one's father to please move back into the house and take the kids so that they wouldn't have to change schools and change friends and what have you. You know, I look on that today, and I'm selfish and I'm self-centered. And if he was willing to come back to the house and take care of the kids, I could go do whatever I wanted to do when I wanted to do it. You know, at the time, I really thought that, that, that I was making a sacrifice for those children. I really didn't believe I had a choice. I knew that I had a problem, but I really thought that I was going to die from, from the disease that I had. Um, never occurred to me that, to stop. It never occurred to me to continue seeking help in other places. So I left the house. He took the kids. I left the house, and I went and I lived on the streets of Atlanta. And I lived on the streets of Atlanta for, for several years, y'all. Um, and I'm going to tell y'all. Like I said, it's a progressive disease, and it doesn't get better. It gets worse. I threw myself into the middle of it, and yeah, I found myself putting myself in situations where um, I, I was beaten, robbed, raped, run over by a vehicle, had my head bashed in with a pipe. Um, and every time any one of those things happened to me, my, my thinking was always, as soon as this is over, where can I go to feed my disease? Where can I go to get what I need in order to not have to feel the way that I'm feeling? And I stayed out there for several years, um, and there were there were lots of arrests involved. There was um, one high speed chase going the wrong way down the interstate. It involved dogs. It involved a helicopter, well, a couple helicopters, <laughs> and it actually ended in an episode of World's Dumbest Criminals. Um, I'm gonna blame that on my co-defendant. Okay. Uh, <laughs> He was driving. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, the consequences really, they really weren't that bad. Three hots and a cot for a few days or until somebody would bail me out. Um, you know, I um, actually spent 55 days in Atlanta one time um, for hitchhiking. Really? Out of all the things. <laughs> hitchhiking. Yes. Did 55 days, um, but but I also um, I, I ended up going to prison. And Georgia has three women's prisons. Metro is the main prison, and that's where you go to be to be determined where you're going to go to. So the first time um, I went to Metro for for my first six weeks, and I'm gonna tell y'all that did not go well. That did not go well. Mm -mm. You think three hot in the cot, but no. Don't tell me what to do or when to do it. Mm -mm. No. Um, I ended up in solitaire. Yeah. Um, it was kind of ugly. But um, from there, I, I got transferred to, to Pulaski, which is one of the main women's prisons. And I'm going to tell you, when I got there, honestly, I mean, the walls were painted pink. They had gardenias. They had roses on the yard. They had bathtubs. I was living a lot better than I was on the streets. <laughs> Um, you know, I mean, I, I had found myself in a place on the streets where I was willing to stand on the corner and sell all the morals, all the values, all the principles that my parents had ever tried to instill in me in order to feed this disease. You know, and a break in prison for a year, it really, it really wasn't that bad. But I'm going to tell you, too, you know, they, they had AA meetings and NA meetings. They had one each once a week. 
And for those, you could get pick, pop, pick points. And pick points count as we're getting out early. And I went to two meetings a week. I couldn't tell you not one topic. I don't remember not one speaker. My gosh, I got I got an 18-month sentence, and I got out in less than a year. Um, and when I came home, my daddy had built me a room on top of his garage. You know, I'd been out whipping and running the streets for years. I hadn't been home to check on my parents. I hadn't showed up for a birthday or a Christmas. I hadn't been home to check on my kids. But my daddy, my daddy built me a room on top of his garage. During that first year that I was in prison, my mom wrote me. She sent me a piece of mail every day. I got a good family, y'all. You know, I got a good family. I have a disease. I have a disease, and I couldn't appreciate what I had. Daddy built me that little room, and I came home. You know, this disease is cunning, it's baffling, it's powerful, but it's patient. And it didn't have to wait very long for me. I stayed home for a month, and after a month, I went back to the streets. You know, I lied to my mom about where I was going, had her, had her drop me off in front of the store. I went around the back wall, or went out the back while she was trying to park. You know, so here I go again, just absolutely shredding my parents, you know, these people that love me. Not to mention my poor children. Um, and they, they didn't know where I was. Mom didn't know why I didn't come back. But I went straight back to the streets. And I, it only took me a month this time to find myself right back in that same spot, find myself right back on that same corner. Willing to sell every moral, every value, every principle that my parents had ever tried to instill in me. Willing to do whatever it took to feed the disease. And I don't know why, but that night, I did have an actual moment of clarity. I looked around and I, and I, and I realized I'd already been out there a month. It wasn't going to be long before I got robbed, before I got raped, before I got beaten, before I got run over, before somebody bashed my head in with a pipe. And I wasn't afraid of dying out there, but I was really, really afraid of having to continue to live the way that I was living. I was really, really afraid of the things that I was going to have to do in order to feed my disease. I was really afraid that I was going to wind up in a wheelchair. And having alienated everybody that ever cared about me, I wouldn't even have anybody to wipe my butt. Because that's, that's where I was. I had pushed away everybody and everything that ever meant anything to me. And so when I had that moment of clarity, I went to a church. I was raised in the church. My parents are good God fearing folks, y'all. Um, I went to a church, but in the hood, they close at dark. They don't leave those doors open all night. <laughs> Surprise. Um, so I couldn't get in. But I did get down on my knees on the steps in front of that church, and I said, God, please, I can't do this. I can't do this. I can't go the places this has taken me. I can't do it again. I'm going to tell you, my God has a sense of humor, too. Because it wasn't two hours later that a couple of Cobb County finest picked me up. <laughs> and um, as I was arguing with the police officer, the main police officer, about whether or not I was going back to jail, um, he told me, he said, look at the other people that were in the car with you. He said, not one of them is looking back here to see what's happening to you. They don't care about you. But I'm going to do you a favor. I'm going to save your life tonight. I'm taking you to jail. <laughs> And at that point, for whatever reason, I ceased fighting. I got in the back of the police car. I pulled my prison ID out of my sock and I slid it to him so that he'd have my real, uh, uh, my real name. Um, and I, and I began my journey. That's when I, you know, that, that was, that was when, like I said, I see, I just, for whatever reason, God, you know, I ceased fighting anything and everything. Um, you know, and it was an absolute miracle. I didn't get in any fights that time when I, while I was in jail. I didn't make any hooch that time while I was in jail. Um, I didn't get a girlfriend that time while I was in jail. <laughs> <laughs> My mom only wrote to me every other day while I was locked up that time. But anyways, um, I spent several, I spent several months in jail. 
And when it was finally time for me to go to court in Cobb County, they had this little bitty tiny holding cell that they put you in. And it has, like, a sink and a toilet. And, you know, if there are two people in there, one can sit on the toilet and one can sit on the sink. And that's all the room there really is. And I was in there with this other girl waiting to go waiting to go into court. And, um, and, and she was crying. And she said, you know, I can't do this. I can't take another charge. I can't take another charge. And I don't know why, but I told her, I said, you know, honey, you don't know what God's got in store for you. He can have your charges dropped right now. You don't know what God's got in store for you. And y'all, my memory is it wasn't five minutes later that the door opened and my public defender stuck his head in and he said, yeah, pointed at me. He said, your charges have been dropped. He said, your police officer didn't show up. Now, don't think you're going home. (laughs) Still on probation and parole from the last time. But the new charges have been dropped. And so from there, I want to think that I went to another county. But anyways, I ended up going back to Metro, the diagnostic, right? Didn't get put in solitaire this time. Didn't get any fights this time. Didn't make any hoots this time. I didn't get a girlfriend this time. But from there, instead of sending me to Pulaski, which is no big deal, bathtubs, carpet, pink paint, flowers. No. They sent me to Washington. Washington was not nice, y'all. Um, Washington didn't even have any air conditioning, not as well as a bathtub or carpet or flowers. And they had spiders that were like the size of my cat's head, right? Really, really not a nice place to be. They also didn't have any AA meetings there. But my very first day there, a girl called to me from across the cafeteria. And y'all got to understand, that's not done. You don't just get to shout at people across the room in prison. It's very structured, right? Um, but she called to me from across the room, and she said, I know you. And I want you to meet me on the yard at right time. And we're, and we're going to have a meeting. And so um, that's what I did. I showed up on the yard, and she told me to show up. And she brought a big book with her. And I said, silly girl, they don't have AA meetings here. She said, silly girl, it only takes two. And so that's what we did. Every yard break we got, we had an AA meeting. And um, and I didn't get any pick points for them. <laughs> yeah. But um, but I had some peace and serenity about me that time. I still, you know, I still had ceased fighting anything and everything. And I was okay with where I was. And I actually read that book from cover to cover. And it was really weird because I could relate to some of the stuff in it. I'm not going to lie to y'all. When I got out after a year, I did not go to a meeting. It never occurred to me. My thinking is skewed. It never occurred to me to look for a meeting. But I was mandated to go to substance abuse classes. Thank you, God. Um, And in those classes, I learned a lot. Uh, The guy that was mentoring, mediating those classes, um, he told us, he said, you know, I know, he said, All of you guys that are in here, he said, I'm going to tell you, this disease is deadly. And three out of four of you are not going to make it. So I want each and every one of you to look to the person on your left. I want you to look to the person on the right. And I want you to look to the person in front of you. And then look at yourself. Take a good, hard look at yourself. Three out of four of you aren't going to make it. Which one are you going to be? And I heard that. That scared me. And um, I asked him after the meeting, I, you know, I don't, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I'm, I'm only supposed to be here for 12 classes. And he told me, he told me he would allow me to come to as many classes as I wanted to come to. And if I wanted to continue to show up after the parole board released me, he would make sure that there was a cheer for me every time I showed up. Hmm. Sounds almost like another place that we go, doesn't it? And during another one of those classes, he said, you know, guys, I know that most of y'all do not want to be here. He said, and I know that it's a lot of work. He said, every one of you has to have a job. You have to pay fines. You have to pay fees. You have to go to meetings. You have to come to this class. You have, you have to check in with your, with your parole and probation officers. All these things you're having to do. He said, but they're filling up your time. You're not using, you're not drinking, and you're way up here. But before too long, you're not going to have to come to these classes anymore. And eventually, you're not going to have to pay fines and fees anymore. Then you're not going to have to go to meetings anymore. Then you're not going to have to report anymore. Eventually, you can quit your job if you want to. But if you don't find something to fill all that time up, before you know it, you're going to be way down here. And that's when you're going to go back out. And I heard that. I heard that, and I knew that I could not take a chance of going way back down there. So I went up to him after the meeting, and I told him, I said, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do, but I've got to do something because I cannot go back to where I was. 
please tell me what to do. And he put his arm around my shoulder and he smiled at me and he said, Julie, have you ever thought about trying AA? <laughs> I mean, some of the folks in these rooms are smart. <laughs> so, so I went home to my parents who had, you know, allowed me to come home to that little room above the garage again. And I told my parents, I said, oh my God, oh my God, I got to go to AA. I got to go to AA. AA is anonymous. How do you find AA? <laughs> And my mom smiled, and she put her arm around my shoulders, and she said, Julie, that church that you became a member of 25 years ago, they have meetings twice a week. <laughs> so that was my first home group call. I immediately found, found the meetings of that church, found the schedule, found out when they were half home, and I began coming to meetings. Now, um, and I'm not going to tell y'all that, you know, that I walked in and immediately got it. That did not happen. Y'all were scary. Y'all were really, really scary, okay? You looked good. You smelled good. I was still wearing combat boots. <laughs> All black. Black lipstick, black nail polish. Some of you remember. <laughs> you know, and I, and I know today that that was my way of trying to scare you off. Just trying to keep you from getting too close to me because I was absolutely terrified of you guys. But you know, there's always that one crotchety old timer who says, keep coming back, keep coming back. And that's what I'm doing. Because I mean, you know, after you've been thrown out of the masquerade, not too many places are willing to tell you to keep coming back. <laughs> so I did. I kept coming back. And, um, you know, and that, and that same crotchety old timer eventually said, have you got a sponsor? Have you got a sponsor? You've got to get a sponsor. Gosh, I was so demanding, but I didn't want to go back to the places that I had been, right? So, I scoped the room out really good. I've been watching, I've been watching y'all. Mm -hmm. I knew who that one lady was that came in with the halo. Y'all know who I'm talking about. Every room's got one. She's got the voice like an angel, really, really sweet. Yep, that's who I wanted for my sponsor. And so eventually I got up the courage and I asked her to sponsor me and she smiled and she put her arm around my shoulders and she said, Julie, I've got too many, but here's your sponsor. And she introduced me. No, she kind of pushed me at our resident AA Nazi. Yes, she did. <laughs> and I'm just going to tell y'all, I was too scared to run. That's exactly how I got my sponsor. And she asked me, she said, do you want what I, oh, no, no. First she said, are you an alcoholic? And I said, No. She thought about that for a minute. <laughs> and she said, well, do you want what I got? And I had to think about that for a minute, okay? <laughs> but, you know, she had double digits of sobriety. And I desperately wanted that. I desperately wanted that. And she said, are you willing to do what I did? And I said, yeah. And we began our journey together. We began working this out. And I'm going to tell you, you know, she taught me that I am an alcoholic. Alcohol is not my problem. Men are not my problem. Drugs are not my problem. <laughs> my thinking is my problem. My thinking is skewed. And sobriety, I have found <laughs> strawberries and chocolate are not my problem. <laughs> my thinking is skewed. You know, but we work when we work really, really hard. And well, I worked really, really hard. So I'm gonna tell y'all, these stuff this stuff did not come easy for me. It took work. Lying, cheating, stealing, that came easy for me. But working these steps, learning to, to practice a program of principles, learning to have integrity, that took a lot of work. And yeah, I guess looking back at me, it took a lot of work on her part too. <laughs> um, but she was willing to work with me. She was absolutely willing to work with me. And, um, whew, okay. So, um, I think probably about six months into my, um, into, into my, my sobriety after being released from prison. And I count that as my sobriety date, y'all, the date that I got out of prison, um, August 23rd of 2004. But that's the day that I started actively seeking a solution to this problem, seeking what I needed to build this hmm, God-sized hole. Um, but about six months after that, my parole officer actually called me and she said, Julie, um, your co-defendants from that case that was dismissed have been have have gotten in a lot more trouble, and so those charges are being brought up. Bleh, 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 bleh. <laughs> They're being brought back up against him, and as a result, you're going to be charged again. I'm like, that's not fair, y'all. That is not fair. That was dismissed. Officer didn't show up, but now that's not how it works. I was going to be recharged. So she said, so this weekend, I don't want you to go anywhere. 
She said, I want you to stay home all weekend. Don't go out. Um, and on Monday morning, you need to hire an attorney. And I'm going to tell you all, you know, I had been going to meetings regularly. I had been working with a sponsor. I had been working with steps. And I heard so many words of wisdom in these rooms. That I would come home, and I would write them on the walls in the ceiling of that room that my daddy had built for me. It was only six foot tall at the very highest point, and from there it, like, went down. So when I woke up every morning, bam, in my face. Let go and let God, one day at a time. All these really, really profound things that y'all said in these rooms. <laughs> you know, and I, actually, I had a friend who had sent me a card, and it said, "Peace." It doesn't mean to be in a place where there's no noise, trouble, or hard work. It means to be in the midst of those things and remain calm in your heart. I did not get that, but it was pretty cool, right? So I wrote it on the wall. Um, so anyways, parole officer says don't go out, hire an attorney. So that's what I did, you know, and my thinking's cute, but I'm not stupid, y'all. I hired that same attorney that had got me off before, right? Um, and when it was time to go, so when it was time to go to court, um, yeah, I went into the courtroom and, and, and my parents went with me and they supported me. My sponsor volunteered to go with me and she hadn't even known. I mean, y'all look, I was still real sketchy, okay? <laughs> but I, but I knew, you know, that I, that I had to do this. And when I went into the court, the judge asked me, he said, um, you know, how do you plead? And I said, I plead guilty. And he said, ma'am, let's wait just a minute. Let's back up. Do you understand that, that this is your, this is your third? felony, this is your third strike, and this, you know, it carries a 30-year sentence. You sure you don't want to rethink <laughs> that guilty plea? And I said, Your Honor, I'm working on program of recovery, and I don't know much, but I know step number one is about honesty, and i got to be honest, I'm guilty. And y'all, that judge sentenced me to seven years. And then he told me he was going to give me credit for a year's time served, and then I could re- serve the remaining six on probation. And I was allowed to walk out of that courtroom that day. The miracles, the promises of this program coming true. And I wasn't even at two step nine yet, y'all. Just saying. Whoa. Um, yeah. So and I mean it wasn't it wasn't easy. No, I was on probation and parole again. They don't make it easy. But it was so much easier than the things that I was doing out there on the streets to feed my disease. It was so much easier than the life that I was trying to live when I was out there. So I continued. I mean, it was working for me so far, right? <laughs> so I continued going, going to the meetings, doing what I was supposed to do, working the steps. Um, I remember at one spot, at one point during my third step, um, no, let's back up just a little bit. Okay, so I'm not even to step three yet, honestly, y'all. But I am, I'm working, and it takes a lot of work for a girl like me, okay? Um, so we'll fast forward a little bit, and I'm actually, I'm, I'm building relationships with my parents, and I'm building relationships with my children. You know, and 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 miracles are just coming true in my life every day. So I'm up in my little room one night. And it's actually it's probably about two in the morning, and y'all gotta understand, I was doing construction work. I was not employable by a real person, but my daddy had a little construction company that he did remodels and repairs on the side, so he was he was employing me. So at 2 in the morning, I'm really, really tired. If somebody's calling me, I better have a good reason. And I'm not talking about no 12-step, y'all. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> um, anyways, it was my mom. It was my mom. My mom was calling me. It's just kind of weird, right? She's in the house across the driveway. And she says, I need you to come over, and I need you to come over now. So I do. I run down the stairs and across the driveway and in the basement and up the stairs and up the stairs. And I fling open the door. And there are two police officers standing there. So I turn around and try to head back down the stairs. <laughs> Mom grabs my arm and she says, please don't go. She said, these officers are trying to tell me that your little brother committed suicide and I need you to tell them that they've made a mistake. This is a family disease, y'all. <laughs> My little brother died from the blood alcohol level of 0.27. And I didn't even know that he was sick. I didn't even know that he had this disease. You know, and if I could trade and be leave with those two police officers, I wouldn't care how many years. 
I figured have my little brother back. Have him have an opportunity to find this wonderful program. These gifts that have been given to me. Because I'm going to tell you guys, at least three out of four of us, three out of four alcoholics are not going to make it. This disease is deadly. It's cunning. It's baffling. It's powerful. And it's a family disease. And it takes work for a girl like me, y'all. Um, so, okay. Yeah. Let me tell you, it's just another one of the gifts that this program has given me, though. And my parents, as much damage as I had done to them, the death of my little brother is something that they will never get over. They'll never get over. They're, they're trudging to make it through. They'll never get over it. But the gift of this program is, I was home and I was sober. I was able to run my daddy's company for him. I was able to feed my parents. I was able to buy an outfit for my little brother to be buried in. I was able to buy clothes for my boys to wear to the funeral. And I was able to carry myself with dignity and respect at that funeral. And for that, I'll ever be grateful for this program. I can't imagine if they had to go through that without me. To help, I'm so grateful that I was able to be there, to hold their hands and to walk through it with them. Because that's what my sponsor taught me. Yeah. So continue on. Got it. Um, working, working my steps. I'm actually, you know, I'm thinking about step three. I'm trying to make a decision on step three. <laughs> sometimes I'm doing step three. Sometimes I'm turning it over. A lot of times I'm taking it back and turning it over and taking it back. Um, but I had this one particular night where um, but things were just tough. I had the meetings that I had to go to. I had the fines I had to pay. I had places that I had to be. I had ordered my mom a gift. Still trying to run my dad's company, and I just didn't have enough time that night. I just didn't have enough time. And so I finished my job. I'd gone home. I pulled into the driveway, and my parents had a gate across the driveway, and it was locked. I don't know who locked it, but they didn't give me a key. And I couldn't get the truck out. It was stuck. It was absolutely stuck. And I remember getting out of that truck and going up into the middle of the road and just screaming at God screaming at him, you want it, you want it, take a look, take a look, it's stuck, you take it, you do it, then, you do it, my God's got a sense of humor, y'all, the father of that girl that I got drunk with, came down the road, he said, it looks like you got a problem, I said, yeah, I'm stuck, and I don't know how to get it out, he said, well, why don't you hop in the back, and I'll hop in the front, and just got a little bit of weight in the back of the truck, yes, a little, little bit of weight in the back of the truck, um, <laughs> It was enough to back that truck right out. Yeah, right there. Sometimes, you know, Spike has worked for me. I'm just saying these character defects, virtues, eh, characteristics out of balance. Spike worked for me that time, but I did. I learned right then and there to turn it over, let it go. I made my decision. I still have some days when I take it back, but I made my decision. And I continue on, and I work with my sponsor. I'm going to tell you all, um, and there was a spot, I got to a spot where, um, where I decided that my youngest son needed to come back and live with me. My oldest son, he was doing, he was doing good. He had made a um, choice to go live with his father. Um, he had been living with me and my parents. He made a choice to go live with his father, but I decided that my youngest son needed to come back and live with me. And, um, you know, because I'm absolutely better than his daddy's doing for him. <laughs> so I called an attorney that I knew. And an attorney that might have done one or two of um, my previous divorces. And I said, you know, my son, I need, I need to get custody of my son back. And he asked me how old my son was. I said, please, 11. And he said, I'll tell you what, why don't you wait until he turns 12. And at the age of 12, I'll have a voice in the court. And when he's 12, if you still think this is the, what you want to do, then absolutely I'll represent you. And we'll, we'll attempt to get your son back. You know, God does for me what I can't do for myself, y'all. And it was just like two months later when that little boy's daddy called and said, I am done, and it is your turn. <laughs> yeah. And my, and my baby came home to live with me. 
you know, and he is a, such a good little alcoholic that's never had a drink. I've got to tell y'all that kid, who is that kid? And I'm going to tell y'all too that, um, you know, after my first year in sobriety, I did, I did begin dating in the rooms and, um, I was in a relationship for five years. Um, and I picked Mr. E. Yes, I did. You know, I knew, I knew what I wanted and I knew what I needed in order to stay sober. And so I picked the guy that shared at every meeting. I picked the guy that had a home group. I picked the guy that had a service position. Um, and that was, that was who I got in a relationship with. And like I said, we were in a relationship for five years, y'all. And I learned so much. I learned so much. I got my own service position. I started getting my own small things. I started showing up at every meeting and I actually began sharing at meetings. And I'm going to tell y'all, y'all may not think that, that was huge for me. That was huge for me to actually share in meetings. And so after five years, um, you know, I realized that that wasn't the relationship that I was supposed to be in. And I also realized that as long as I'm holding on to something I'm not supposed to have, then my hands aren't free for God to place in them the gift that he's got for me. And and, and so that relationship ended. And I'm not going to tell y'all I didn't leave claw marks on that man. I did. But, but I was willing. Y'all taught me to be willing. You know, and my sponsor was teaching me to be a woman of dignity and respect. And I was sponsoring women in these programs. And I was working the steps with women, women in these rooms. And life is really, really good. Did I tell you I got a job? Yeah. Hello? Like a real job? Yes, I did. Matter of fact... Fast forward a couple of years, I had two jobs. One job in an office working all day long, and then somebody else was willing to give me a job just for the weekends, selling and sampling candy. Hello, an alcoholic's dream job, right? And he was willing to pay me to go to different states to do this. He was willing to pay me to take my son and pay for my son to sell and sample candy for him also. What a miracle was that? You know, there was a time. Mm-mm, kicked out of the masquerade, I'm just saying, you know. Yeah, miracles just coming, coming true. You know, and I, um, and I became, you know, I was able to become fully self-supporting. And at one point I was actually, I was talking to another crotchety old-timer, complaining to her, you know, about the fact that I wasn't in a relationship, didn't have a man. She said, Julie, why don't you make a job requirement list? Well, what's that? She said, if you were going to hire somebody to clean your toilet, you'd have a job requirement list. I'm thinking the job of being your partner in life might be a little more important, and you might want a job requirement list. Hmm. Okay. All right. Mm-hmm. I might be slow, but I ain't stupid. So I made a really good job requirement list, and I put all kinds of things on it, like having to be really active in the home group, having to have a service position, having to have a sponsor. I don't know why it never occurred to me to like look for a non-alcoholic, but it didn't. You guys look good to me. <laughs> Isn't it funny how that perspective changes? Because when I came in, y'all did not look good to me. I mean, you looked good, but you were really scary, right? But you know, that, those were the things that I wanted, and I wanted a man, you know, a man of dignity and honor. I wanted a man who was fully self-supporting. I wanted a man who didn't need me. I wanted a man who was willing to love my children as his own. I mean, I'm telling y'all, y'all think an eight foot or an eight step is a booger of a list? Y'all should have seen this list, okay? So I went back to my girlfriend and I was like, okay, I did it. Here's the list. Here's the list. Now, what do I do to find this guy? Oh, yes, some of y'all heard this one, huh? <laughs> she told me I don't get that no guy with all those qualities and characteristics would deserve to be stuck with me. <laughs> that it was my job to become that person so that I didn't need anybody else. <laughs> Wait, well, y'all want to talk about work? Mm-hmm. But that's what I did. And that's the thing I was willing. I was absolutely willing to go to any lengths. I was absolutely willing to do what I was told. You know, I'm going to tell y'all something. Prison taught me a lot about structure and about following direction. I was not happy when I was there, but I can look back on it today with gratitude in my heart because I learned a lot. I did not have that discipline and structure before I went in there. Thank God. Because I'm going to tell you something. You know, my sponsor has asked me to do a lot of stuff. When I did my four step, I had to paint her house, right? Yes, I did. I painted her house. But I looked back on it, and, you know, painting her house had out so much energy. 
She's asked me to do a lot of stuff, including work for her. She never asked me to drop squat and call. <laughs> that was funny, y'all. <laughs> so anyways, I'm working. I'm working all week in an office, and I'm working on the weekends for this um, chocolate company. And in the fall, we work a lot. So I'm scheduled to work 12 weekends out of 13. And um, and on that 13th weekend, <laughs> I'm scheduled to work for my sponsor. <laughs> But that Friday when I got off work, took my son out to eat. And while we're standing in line, my phone starts ringing. And I'm like, just answer it, would you? And he answers the phone, and he starts getting so excited. And he's like, yeah, 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 yeah. And he hangs up the phone. I'm like, who does that? Y'all do that. So, yes, it was an alcoholic. It was a, you know, a woman that I knew from the rooms, and she was inviting us to go do something that night. And that's the other thing that I learned in these rooms. When I get invited to go do something, I do it. I don't always want to go do it but I do it. And it doesn't matter if it's a picnic. It doesn't matter if it's a raffle. It doesn't matter if it's somebody's baby shower. You know, today I suit up and I show up. And, um, you know, one of the things that I've got written here is in 1959, Bill Wilson wrote, in AA we aim not only for sobriety, but we try again to become citizens of the world that we rejected and of the world that once rejected us. And that's what I do today. I try so, you know, I, I work at being present and accountable in every aspect of my life. So anyways, this lady had asked us to do something. She wanted us to go to a haunted house. Like, it's Friday night. i got to get up and go to work for my sponsor in the morning. But you know this kid's face, and I miss so much with this kid. And, you know, how do you make amends to a kid that you neglected? How do you make amends to a kid that you weren't there for? Any way you can. And sometimes that includes going to another world haunted house. That's what I did. We went to Netherworld that night. And um, and we caravaned down. We actually met at um, at one of the local clubhouses. And we all caravaned down. It's a whole big group. I mean, like, people invited people, invited people. There were so many of us that went down there. I actually ended up with somebody else's kid in my car. That's a miracle. People were willing to trust me with other kids, too. Yeah. But they did. Um, so when we get down there, the other kid chickens out and he won't go in. And my, God bless my kids, little people, pleasing heart. He wouldn't go in either. And I was stuck, looking at going to the netherworld. Y'all ever been there? Yeah. It's like one of the scariest haunted houses in the country. And I'm stuck looking at going in by myself. That is not okay. <laughs> I mean, I'm fully self-supporting and everything, but for real. <laughs> um, but it just have, so happened that a friend of a friend... Um, a, a guy didn't have anybody to go through with him either. And he said, I'll go through with you. And yeah, he was a perfect gentleman. He was a perfect gentleman. He didn't even try to fill me up. <laughs> it was a little weird. Not that. <laughs> the whole way through the haunted house, he kept saying, look up. It's so beautiful. And I would look up, and I would see, like, these rocks with muck and monsters, you know. I'd put my head back down, and he'd say, no, look up. It's so beautiful. Yeah, it was a little weird. Um, but anyways, he was a perfect gentleman, and I was able to carry myself with my head down with dignity and honor that night, right? Um, and the next morning, I was able to get up, and I was able to go to work for my sponsor. He didn't even ask for my phone number before he left. But, you know, he'd been paying attention. He'd been listening. And, um, and that was kind of something new for me, too. You know, he showed up at my sponsor's, at my sponsor's job the next day. And he handed me a business card, and he said, if you ever want to go to a meeting, give me a call. And he walked away. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, this girl, this girl was quite a bit shy at that time, right? So I waited until I was safely on my way out of state to my other job um, before I called him. And actually, I think I waited a couple weeks before I called him. And we talked the entire way. From, from Georgia too. I think I was going to North Carolina that weekend or something like that, but we talked the whole way. And during the talk, it came up that, you know, what do you, what do you do for a living? And I was telling him what I do. And um, he was telling me that he's a stonemason. And I was like, oh, she wanted me to look up at the stone mark. And he said, no, silly. I wanted you to look up so I could see your beautiful face. Wow. Wow. Yeah, so, you know, um, told my sponsor, talked to my sponsor about it, and my sponsor agreed to teach me how to date. Matter of fact, she went on at least the first date with me. <laughs> but 
that's what we did. We dated, and um, you know, and it was absolutely amazing. It was absolutely amazing. Um, we did. We only dated for four months when um, when he proposed to me. I know that scared the shit out of my sponsor. <laughs> But, you know, he was a gentleman about it. He had already called my daddy in Virginia and asked for my hand in marriage. He'd already talked to my children about it and got their blessing. Um, and, you know, and, and we sat down and we talked about it like adults, which was really new for me, too, okay? Because y'all got to understand, four marriages before, four marriages and divorces before 30. I'm over 40 now, right? Um, so we sat down and we talked about it like adults and you know and 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 I knew that I absolutely wanted to trudge this road with him but I also remember the one year rule I said I you know what I absolutely will marry you but only if you agree that we can be engaged for more than a year before we get married and so that's what we did and we took our time y'all and we planned it we planned it and we were fully self-supporting we paid for my parents to come down and stay in the honeymoon suite. <laughs> and we got married in Helen. And I'm going to tell y'all, you know, my daddy walked me down the aisle. My son, my, my baby, was the tallest ring bearer you ever did see at 18 years old. <laughs> and my sponsor danced at my wedding along with my sisters in sobriety. And it was an absolutely beautiful thing. Four previous marriages. And I don't remember a lot about them. <laughs> I don't remember anything about any of those honeymoons. <laughs> but this one, I remember every moment of it. I remember every moment of it. And after we dropped our kids off, because he has two kids too, y'all. I'm not just blessed to have my children back in my life. I'm blessed that I have stepchildren now. I mean, what an honor and a privilege is that. Because, I, you know, for a long time, I was not fit to be like a dog mama. Okay? But now I have children and I have stepchildren. So after we dropped our kids off and we were headed out of town for our honeymoon, we were going, we were headed into Florida, and there was this one spot where it was an obvious speed trap. There were police cars with people pulled over on both sides of the road. The blue lights are flashing, and I look out over the water. It's right at a bridge, and I look out over the water, and the full moon is shining down on that water. And I grabbed my husband's hand, and I said, you know what? This is it. This is the return to sanity. My car is not stolen. I got a driver's license. I got insurance. <laughs> this is the return to sanity. I'm not living in that, that insane life that I lived for so very, very long. You know, and today, I mean, I'm going to tell you, we have fires in sobriety. My friend, my friend, my old, my crossy old friend, he's here somewhere. He knows that we have fires in sobriety. But today I know what it means to have, to remain calm in my heart. I know what peace is today, y'all. Y'all have taught me that. And today my life is so good. It's not easy. These last couple of years have been really, really hard. Really, really hard. I think it was 2014 when my husband and I found out that I was sick. And um, in 2015, I had to have surgery done. And But, you know, I had been at my job. I had been at my job for nine years. Did y'all know if you work for a company that long, they, like, give you vacation and stuff even? <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. So they, they gave me two weeks vacation to recover from the surgery, and um, I had some complications. I ended up in the ER, and after two weeks, I knew that I wasn't going to be ready to go back to work. So I acted like an adult. I um, called my boss, and I said, I need another week. And they said, no problem. They actually volunteered to give me another week's vacation time. I took another week. I told him I didn't need the vacation time, but I just needed another week to heal, and so that's what I did. But, you know, my God's got a sense of humor, y'all. I was not happy at that company, and I was really struggling with some of the um, the lack of ethics and principles. And my sponsor kept telling me, if you don't do something, God's going to do for you what you can't do for yourself. And the day I got back, after having that surgery done, the day I actually showed back up to work, to work, they fired me on the spot without ever even letting me clock in. And, you know, I learned that if you're doing what you're supposed to do, if you have integrity, if you actually stay at a job for a long time, and you get fired, the government will like pay you to stay home. It's called unemployment. <laughs> the truth is, y'all, I wasn't ready to go back to work. I was really sick still. I wasn't ready to go back to work, and I got to stay home for an additional four weeks. And, and I was able to do what was required of me in order to get that check every week. I haven't missed a week's pay since I've been sober. 
I was able to do what was required of me in order to, to get that check. And at the end of a month, one more week, I got an even better job. I got offered a job with a multi-million dollar company that wanted me to be the face and the voice of that company. Obviously, they didn't do a background check, right? <laughs> but you know, God is really, really good, y'all. I'm still with that company. I still get to be the face and the voice of that company. Yes. You know, and it is and it is absolutely amazing. They tell me that I'm the sunshine, I'm their mascot. I have no idea. <laughs> you only saw my mugshot. <laughs> Yeah, so life is really, really good. And I was with that company for nine months, so and um, my husband and I realized that, yeah, I was still really, really sick. And that company paid me to stay home for nine weeks and recover after the surgery that had to be done. And when the insurance wouldn't cover the surgeries that were done, that company stepped in and paid for my surgeries that had to be done. And, you know, I just keep doing, I keep doing the next right thing. And it's so funny. You know, I, I get asked to, when I get asked to do something, I do it. And my husband and I were talking, and I think last year we went, we went, we went 10 different places. And um, 10 different places for AA things. And it, was, and it was hard. Because, again, last year I had to have surgery done again. Um, and, again, last year my company stepped up and they made sure that everything was taken care of. But last year I only had to take one week to recover. And today I'm doing so much better. And even with having surgery last year, we didn't have to miss not one commitment. That's what happens when you're working a program of recovery. You know, today, what is different today, that hole, it's filled with God. It's filled with AA. It's filled with every one of you and your beautiful, bright, shining faces. Y'all have no idea how much I love you guys. I look out here and I see so many faces that I know, that I respect that I love, all this love and support. And these last couple of years have been kind of, they've been difficult. Um, but you know, the miracles haven't stopped. I have a different sponsor today, but I still have an awesome relationship with that first sponsor that did so much for me. And my sponsor today, she's, she's quiet, she's calm, she has this peace about her that I so desperately need. And, and she understands the medical issues that I'm going through, and she helps me with that. You know, today... I have an amazing husband that I absolutely adore y'all, but I gotta tell you something. I don't need him. <laughs> and you know what? He doesn't need me. Today, it's a choice. We choose to be together and we choose to trudge this road of happy destiny together. You know, we have an amazing life together. This girl, this girl, that guy, we bought a house last year. <laughs> Y'all, that is huge, okay? I never actually had bought a car before. We bought a house. We have a garden. We have a cat that showed up and decided it wanted us to be its people. You know? <laughs> you know, I found out last week that my stepdaughter's going to have a baby. You know, and she was so excited and proud to tell me. I'm still not sure how I feel about that. Um, because it's just all about me sometimes. <laughs> but I know that no matter what life throws at us, we can do this together. As long, as long as, you know, as long as we remember that our relationship is what it's important. Me and my feelings, not so important today. I realize that sometimes I still get stuck in that fantasy world, you know? Um, but what's important is what we have in these rooms. What is important, you know, is the person that I've grown to become. You know, what is important, you know, today I have a relationship with my parents, with my children. My daddy is so proud of me today. And that's amazing because there was a time he would go into prison and we would get together with all his little minister friends and they'd be like, so my child is going to Yale. My dad would be like, yeah, my daughter's at Washington. She's at Washington. <laughs> you know? Today he's proud of me. Um, and I'm so very grateful for that. You know, I believe, I believe that God brought me into these rooms these rooms brought me to God, and together y'all have filled that huge empty soul to that place in my soul. You know, today I look in the mirror, and I'm, you know, most days I'm all right with what I see back, looking back at me. A lot of days I admire and I respect the woman that I see looking back at me. 
You know, today, my life is so very, very good. I just can't even tell you. One of the book talks about being rocketed into the fourth dimension. I feel like that's where I am. I am absolutely amazed when I look around, and it's because of you guys. It's because of these rooms. It's because of these steps. I wouldn't be here without each and every one of you. You know, and if you're new, you're just coming into AA, I'm telling you guys, did y'all hear my story? If I can do it, you can do it. Just don't give up five minutes before the miracle. Keep coming back. It works if you work it. Thanks for letting me share it out. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.